how do you handle crisis, right? When, when life feels kind of out of control, maybe it's financial insecurity, job loss, or you're watching a child go down a direction, a path that you know is going to be dangerous for them or, or detrimental to their future, or, or maybe it's uh, you don't get the grades in school and you're failing classes. What's your response in the midst of crisis? For me, uh, early in my marriage, which honestly, actually before we got married, we were, we were looking towards marriage, we were engaged, and we went through kind of really our first big crisis. And I'm really not proud of how I handled this, but this is the truth of it. So my wife found out, she was in the Army National Guard, and she found out her unit is going to deploy to Afghanistan. And I begun a, a, an emotional roller coaster in this moment. I was terrified, right? There were moments of just tears. There were moments of punching pillows. Like I had the gamut of emotions and this caused all kinds of frenetic activity for me. I, I went, uh, we went to her superiors and said, is there any way we can postpone her deployment or is there any way out of this? Like we have a wedding coming. Uh, this is a huge transition in our life. And, and I didn't know, like, what is this gonna mean for our marriage? right? Newlyweds. And my wife is in a different country. Like, how is that going to work? And I'm a young Christian. I'm trying to figure out how, how do we be Christians that are married? And, and, and on top of all that, she's going to Afghanistan. What if she gets hurt there? Or what if it's a dangerous situation she's involved in? And I'm frantic. I'm freaking out. And it feels like this impending doom is coming our way. And so, uh, after talking to her superiors, it was very clear. The answer is no, this unit is deploying. And so is she. This is part of her duty. And she signed up for this. And so, okay, well, I'm not done with trying to make this stop. So uh, we decide, okay, if this, if this unit is going to deploy, maybe we can transfer to another one. So we actually uprooted our life here in Oregon and moved to Northeastern Washington. And honestly, there was other reasons for that move as well. But a big key factor was maybe we could transfer to another unit that wasn't deploying. So we moved our whole life to, to Northeastern Washington, to Spokane, and the interstate transfer to a different unit didn't go through. She still was in this unit, still had to come down to Oregon every month to, to prepare for deployment. And all along the way, after we got married, we were trying to have a child. Yes, because we wanted children, but also as a, a way of escaping this deployment. And, and, I, and I say all this... And I'm not proud of it, but I want to be honest about how, my, how I responded in the midst of crisis. You know, as I look back on this season, uh, uh, I th- one word sums up my life, fear. And what was driving that fear was three beliefs. Firstly, God has abandoned me. I'm utterly alone. Second, and God doesn't care. Third, Have you ever been in that space where you're brought to hard circumstances and it just feels like, God, are you even here? God's people have been wrestling with this for ages. We've seen it all through the Israelite story so far, right? They come upon crisis after crisis after crisis, right? The Red Sea moment where death is coming for them. Pharaoh's army wants to destroy them and they're in a crisis and God provides a way out. They get to the other side of the Red Sea and you think it'd be all up and to the right from here. Nope. They come to a crisis where they have bitter water that they can't drink and they grumble and complain against Moses and really against God. And then right after that, there's the crisis of food, these humanitarian crises, these needs. These aren't just wants. These are things they need to live to survive. And so they're continually brought in these positions of crisis because God is trying to teach them that he is sovereign, that he is in control, that he is their source, that he's their provider, that he is the great I am and he loves them and will be there for them among them in the midst of it. And today we're going to see more crises are coming for the Israels, Israelites. Watch this. We're in Exodus chapter 17. It says in verse 1, All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord. If you have your Bible, uh, underline, circle, or highlight that phrase, according to the commandment of the Lord. That is, in my mind at least, a a key that kind of unlocks this passage. And we'll touch back on that a couple times. But I want you to take note, according to the commandment of the Lord. Why are they where they're at? God commanded, God is leading them, okay? 
they, uh, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. Now, Rephidim, it literally translates to something similar to, to a rest stop, right? So this is a place of respite for weary, wandering travelers, right? <clears throat> and so the Israelites are exhausted day in and day out in the hot, arid desert, right? Setting up camp, breaking down camp, following God wherever he goes, being in crisis after crisis. Think of how physically, mentally, and emotionally spent these people are. And they come to this place called Rephidim, right? The rest stop, but there's a problem. But there was no water for the people to drink. Yikers, right? Like terrible rest stop, right? This is like when you're driving along the freeway, you need a little rest, but you stop at the rest stop and the bathrooms are out of order, okay? Like this is awful, right? This is the place where they're gonna camp. They're gonna rest here and there's no water for the people. Remember, this is a hot, arid location. They're dehydrated. They've been pushing their bodies to the brink over and over and over again. And now they're at another crisis. There's no water. Verse two, therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Now there's nothing wrong with them advocating for their need. That's a good thing, right? They're advocating for their need. The problem is with the word quarreled. They quarreled against Moses. They didn't come to Moses and say, hey, we have this need, let's seek the Lord. They weren't thinking through this carefully. They weren't praying to God about this. They come to Moses again, grumbling, quarreling against him. And that word quarreling in our language, it doesn't have really the fullness of the weight of the original word here. Uh, When I think of quarreling, I think of two kids duking it out on the playground. But this isn't a physical altercation. It's not even just a verbal altercation. Here's what's happening here. The word quarrel in Hebrew, it connotes a bringing a legal accusation or charge against Moses. So here, they're bringing this legal accusation against Moses. They're, they're not just arguing, but this, is, this has got weight behind it. Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? He's, he's tired of this. This has been ongoing, ongoing. Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? Again, he's saying, look, Your frustrations and quarreling with me is really just indicative of your heart towards God. Like this is not about me. I'm following the Lord's lead. We're following the Lord as a people and you don't like where he's leading us. And so you're quarreling, you're really testing God. Why do you test the Lord? Verse three, but the people thirsted there for water And the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? We've heard this before, right? This should be total deja vu to us, by the way. (laughs) They just went through a problem where they didn't have water and God provided. And you'd think maybe if faith is a history lesson, they would look back and say, wow, remember last time we were in this position, God did something cool. Let's trust him again but they don't. And they're quarreling, they're arguing. And actually they accuse Moses again of intentional evil. They say, Moses, you're a murderer. And the weapon you've chosen to kill us is the wilderness. You have brought us out here to decimate the people of God from the earth. They say, you brought us out here to kill us, our heritage, all our lineage, our children, and our provisions, our livestock. This is the Uh, accusation. Uh, They they believe God and Moses want to kill them and destroy them from the face of the earth. This is the antithesis of God's promise to this very people. He says, look, I'm going to bring you into a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to make you multiply and fill the earth as many descendants as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. That's his promise. And here they're saying, no, dude, you've brought us out here, Moses, to kill all of us. So Moses cried to the Lord. Isn't it interesting? Over and again, the people turned to Moses. And what does Moses do? He has nothing, he has nothing to offer them. How are you going to give millions of people enough water? And so Moses goes again to the one who has all control, all power, and who loves these people. So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with these people? I love that his first question isn't even about water. He's just like, God, what do I do here? They're grumbling, they're complaining, they're quarreling against me. And what shall I do with these people? Moses said, 
they are almost ready to stone me. <laughs> what? Like, I've had my kids hangry before, but I, my life has never been on the line because I didn't give them food or water, okay? And Moses here is, he's, he's, he, I don't think he's dramatizing it. I think the people of Israel are tired of living in these crisis moments. They're weary, they're scared, they're exhausted, and they're ready to kill Moses. And so he cries out to the Lord. Verse five, and the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people. <laughs> Pass on before, you mean the people who are picking up stones to kill me, God? Like if I'm Moses in this situation, I'd be like, God, I've been taught that if there's a bully at the end of the street, you kind of go around the block, like you don't parade in front of them, right? But God says, I want you to pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel. And I want to be clear here, there's a lot of confusion about what an elder was in Israel. There's not a lot of consensus. We know that it's not the elders that we have today for the church that we're commanded to in the New Testament, But uh, these were probably elder statesmen in the tribes. Israel was very tribal. And so it was probably elder statesmen of the day. So some of the leaders, some of the older generation of the leaders of Israel are to come with him. But that's not it. And take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. So he says, I want you to go, you and the elders and the staff. Before these, this people, in the midst of their grumbling, sinning, and complaining against me and, and your leadership, I want you to take the symbol of my power and presence. Israelites know every time Moses has this staff, it's not just any old stick. Like he does some cool stuff. God does amazing things through him. And I, I want to be able to say this well, so I'm going to uh, try and slow down here. But I love this moment between God and his people. So let's get a picture of what's going on here. Their hearts are hard, sinful, disobedient, grumbling, complaining, quarreling. That's their heart. And God says, Moses, I want you to remind them of my power and presence among them by parading this staff in front of them. It's as though God is like gently helping their faith along. Yes, you're in a crisis, but don't forget my power and my presence. Remember what, this, what happened at the Nile when they, we used the staff and the power of God went out in judgment against Egypt? Remember at the Red Sea when this staff was the instrument of God's power that parted the Red Sea and then on the other side when the waters crashed down, killing your oppressors? Remember, I'm powerful and I'm present. Don't forget that. I'm here. I'm not far away. And so God, it seems, is helping his people in the midst of their faith journey by reminding them of his power and presence. Verse six, behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it and the people will drink. So God says, go do this, hit the rock with the staff Water will come out, people will drink. There's lots of opinions about how does this happen? Was there a spring under the rock or what exactly happened here? And frankly, we don't know. It doesn't say if this was just miraculous or if it busted down to a a natural spring that was there. We don't know. But what we do know is God provides exactly what his people need. He shows them that he's there by this, this emblem of his power and presence, the staff of God, and then he provides for their needs. But I think it's very interesting how Moses kind of closes out this story. You would assume that he would say, and all of God's people drank from the water and were satisfied, but that's not how he ends this passage. Listen to this. Verse 34, as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, Verse six, before it, I will stand before you on the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it. And there, the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders. And he called the name of the place. Now this is Moses writing this down. He called the name of the place Masa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel. And because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? And that's not a fairy tale ending. He doesn't end it with, man, and God provided and everybody just rejoiced. No, God did provide. But he ends the story with an emphasis on the heart of, of the people of Israel. And here's the question on their mind. Is the Lord among us or not? They're brought to crisis. And the response to that crisis is, if God is good and my circumstances are not good, it must mean that God has abandoned us. 
It must mean that God parted the Red Sea and said, see you guys in heaven, good luck. But that's not the case. Do they have evidence that God is present? Absolutely they do. But this is what they're wrestling with in this moment. So they're at this rest stop, Rephidim. God provides the water. He reminds them of his presence as Moses parades the emblem of his power and presence among them. And then things get worse. Verse eight, then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. What? Like, come on, can we not get a break here? Like, Amalek comes to fight with Israel. Now, Israel is, uh, uh, they're weary, they're wandering former slaves. They're not trained for battle. Like, they have weapons, but they're not trained for battle. Like, here, I've got a weapon, all right? This is the master sword from the legend of Zelda, right? This is on display in my house as a, as a choice piece of our, of our uh, nerddom. But this weapon in my hand means absolutely nothing, right? Like I can't swing this thing the right way. Nobody wants to hire me to be the security guard in their home, right? And the Israelites, they had weaponry, but they didn't have the know-how. They didn't have the skill set. They didn't have any training. They were former slaves. And you don't teach a slave how to use weapons because there might be a rebellion. So they were probably no better off than I am holding this thing. I feel like a total nerd, but they had weapons, but they had no skill set for them versus the Amalekites. Now the Amalekites were a nomadic tribe and they were known for uh, barbaric warrior, uh, for being barbaric warriors and, and plundering the people they go up against. In fact, Egypt, the superpower of the day, when, uh, when they were corresponding with some of the other uh, powers that be during the day, the Canaanites and other people groups, uh, they had these tablets called the Amarna tablets. And on these tablets, they would talk about, um, they, they, they talked about the Amalekites. And Egypt, remember, Egypt is a global superpower. And here's how they talk about the Amalekites. Vicious plunderers. The Amalekites are warriors. They're trained. This is their lifestyle. This is how they provide for themselves. And they're going up, and it seems to be an unprovoked attack against Israel. And so they're going up against Israel. And this battle, this fighting and this warring with, between the Israelites and the Amalekites it will go forward on the timeline, but it also actually, interesting, interestingly enough, it goes backwards as well because Amalek is the son of Eliphaz and Eliphaz, his daddy, Esau. Esau, his brother, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. So here we have Amalek, a descendant of Esau and Uh, Israel, descendants of Jacob at war. And what happened? This all came from the brokenness in Jacob and Esau's home. The two brothers, there was backbiting and favoritism and hatred and and lying and thieving. And ultimately, at one point, they wanted to kill each other. And because of this lineage, it's going down all the way to today where we're seeing the Israelites and the Amalekites warring with one another. And this is going to move forward into the future as well. So there's this unprovoked attack at this rest stop. This rest stop seems terrible, okay? Not only are the bathrooms out of order, but there's a thug that wants your lunch money too. So Moses said to Joshua, this is the first entrance of Joshua in the story. I want you to notice how Joshua's character uh, very much um, is, is kind of the antithesis of what we've seen of the Israelites so far, of them, of the Israelites in general. It talks about their grumbling, their complaining, their disobedience. Look at Joshua. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Now, if I'm Joshua in this moment, I'm like, hold on, hold on, Moses. So the battle plan is I go down there with some guys and we put skin in the game while you're playing pickup sticks on top of the mountain. What? No, buddy. You're leading the charge. Get down in the trenches with me. But Joshua doesn't do that. He's so, uh, he, he presents himself as a man of character. Moses tells him what the plan is. And here's what Joshua does. Verse 10. So Joshua did as Moses told him. 
We've seen the Israelites disobeying Moses and God through Moses over and over and over in the last few chapters. Joshua presents himself as a man of character and dependability. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up on top of the hill. And Aaron, just a reminder, is Moses' brother. Hur, uh, most commentators and scholars say he's probably Moses' brother-in-law, that uh, his sister, the prophetess, Miriam, uh, her husband might have been her. But that's not in scripture. That's just extra biblical information. So these three guys go up on the hill. Verse 11, whenever Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. This is, a, this is a weird thing that happens here. It's like when Moses raises his hands, touchdown, we're winning. But when Moses puts his hands down, we're losing. And there's tons of conjecture around why this is. And frankly, the Bible does not tell us why this was God's battle plan. And we have to just be okay with that. There's some, from the context here, we may be able to pull out just an idea of why, but I want us to be okay. God did this crazy thing through Moses as he raises the staff. The Israelites win. As he lowers it, they lose. And there's no real good explanation, but I want to take a stab or a poke at potentially why. I think God wants it very clear who's winning the battle. It's not that the Amalekites skipped breakfast today and they're just weak and weary and aren't fighting well. It's not that Joshua chose these excellent warriors. Remember, they had the equipment, but they did not have the training. It's not as though Moses had some great battle plan. No, God's saying, I win the victory. And as Moses raises the staff, remember, that's the emblem of God's power and presence among his people. God's victory is wrought. And as it's lowered, the Amalekites begin to win the victory. God wants it very clear who brings the victory. Verse 12, but Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were held steady until the going down of the sun and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Um, and I, I want to posit something here. So I've only ever heard this passage taught from this perspective. Moses is up on top of the hill and he's just praying for the victory of God. He's up there with the staff and he's got these two compadres up there with him and they're all having a prayer jam up on top watching the battle happen. And these two compadres are helping him to pray and, and to do this difficult task that God has given him. And so the kind of the application of this passage that I've often heard is, is make sure you have great community around you that prays with you, that does hard things for Jesus with you. And, and I'll, I'll say, that's true. Like you should, and we should have great community. That's why life groups are so important. That's why discipleship groups are so important. And, and, and we should have people who are praying with us and helping us uh, be pointed to Jesus and live out the calling that Jesus has for us. Those things are true, but I'd posit that that's not what this passage is talking about. You see, because this passage is not about Moses, about Aaron, about her, Joshua, the Israelites, the Amalekites. Remember what God is doing in Exodus is he's revealing himself. And how do we know that this is not a, a passage on community? Well, let's look at the context here. What comes next? Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I, I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under the heavens. God says, it's not about anybody else but me. I'm the one doing this. I'm the one who's providing the victory against the Amalekites. And he goes on. It says, verse 15, And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. There's three really major different interpretations of that phrase, a hand upon the throne of the Lord. One of them is that this is Moses' hand raising the staff. Another one is that this is God's hand that mightily brought victory. And the third one, the one that I tend to gravitate towards because of the flow of the sentence here, is that this is the, the, the fist of Amalek making a gesture and shaking his fist at God's throne. 
It says, a hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So it seems as though in the flow of the passage here that Amalek and the Amalekites raise their fists against God. Later, as they talk about this moment uh, with the Amalekites and the Israelites, it talks about how they offended God's glory. And here he raises his fist against God and God says, I'm going to blot you out, buddy. Uh, You are done for. I'm going to have war with you from generation to generation. You're done for. And so we have these two kind of crisis moments in this passage, chapter 17. The first one of real physical need. And the second of real physical need for safety. Physical need, physical safety. And, and right in the midst of that, we see this profound truth that God is with us. God was with them. Right? Is that not the question that we heard them say earlier? Is God among us? Has he just hung, in us, hung us out to dry? Like these are bitter circumstances. This stuff hurts. We're going to war. What about our children? What about our elderly and infirm? How are we going to provide water? There's all of this fear and insecurity. And the question that that prompts in their hearts is, is the Lord among us? Look at it. Is he among us or not? Does he even care? Is he here? If God is good and for us, why does my life not feel so good right now? Why do I keep coming into these crisis moments? And look at what God does for them. Verse six, behold. Whenever you read behold, think of God just gently grabbing the face of the person he's talking to and say, listen up. This is so important. Make sure you hear what I'm about to say. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he says, like, I will stand before you. Yes, I'm going to provide water, but I'm giving you something far greater. I will be there. Now, I don't know, and it doesn't say what this looked like, felt like, was like. How did they experience that God stood before them? Um, but, But this was a moment where God is saying, I'm here. The question on your heart is, are you among us or not, God? And God says, I am here. I'm present. I am with you. I have not abandoned you. Think about the power of God's presence in this moment. Right? If Moses just struck the rock and water came out, the people of Israel would just be like, well, that's cool. Good job, Moses. But no, God shows up in this visceral, vivid way that we don't know what it looked like, but God says, I will stand before you and the waters come out. And it's this picture before Israel that God is there even when things hurt. God is with us even in the midst of our crises. So here's my question for you. Do you believe that? Like in the midst of a crisis, in the midst of when, it, when things really hurt, Can you believe and trust that God is with you? You see, we see clearly looking back on Israel's story, we see, man, look at how God was there. But in the midst of their story, their question is our question often, right? In the midst of the pain and the crisis, often our circumstances tend to eclipse God, do they not? Right? I know that's my case, at least. Emotional pain and turmoil and wrestling, it tends to just eclipse my God. And it did for them too. So in the midst of crisis, what is your response? Can you trust a God you cannot see with pain you deeply feel? In the midst of your pain, God is with you. God is for you. He's there even if you can't see it and even if you can't feel it and even if you don't want to believe it. He's there. Think about the power of presence. My daughter hates going back to the back part of our house at nighttime because there's a long hallway that kind of separates it from the rest of the house, the back bedrooms from the front of the house. And and she hates going back there because it's scary to be alone. But when daddy's there, no fear. Why? Not because I'm some superstar wrestler. I've got a sword that I don't even know how to use, okay? But because because I'm present with her. And we're going to walk through, even if there is something scary, I'll be with her in the midst of it. Think about when you go to the home of somebody who's grieving or you go to a funeral. 
You know, people often mince meat about, man, what should I, what, what, what's the right thing to say? What Bible verse should I give them? What advice should I give? How do I fix this situation? But over and again, when you leave the house of somebody who's grieving, you leave a funeral, what do they say? Thank you for coming. Thank you for being present. Thank you for just your, your being here with me in this moment means so much. And that's what God's doing for them in this moment. And that is what God is doing for us, regardless of the circumstances of our life. So have the circumstances of your life eclipsed your God. I thought it was so interesting as I was reading through this passage. Let's look at uh, verse one again. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord. Why were they in the position to be at war with Amalek? According to the commandment of the Lord. Why were they in the position where they needed the waters? According to the commandment of the Lord. Why, did God, why, why, why were they in the position where they had no food according to the leading of the Lord? Why were they in position at Mara where they had no water according to the leading of the Lord? Look, God, it says, according to the commandment of the Lord, he led them to a place where there was no water to drink. And you may read that and say, wow, that's, God, that's, that's kind of cruel. But God is trying to teach them, I am with you. I am for you. I am your God. I am in control. I'm sovereign. I love you. I'm your provider. Will you trust me? Can you trust your God despite the circumstances of your life? Just because we're walking through difficult things does not mean God has abandoned you. I kind of sum it up this way. The presence of difficulties does not mean the absence of God. The presence of difficulties does not mean the absence of God, even when you cannot see him. And listen, in the moment, you may not be able to see him at all. Like we can see clearly God shows up in these visceral and vivid ways for the Israelites. And often my heart is like, God, can't you just show up like that for me? But he's, he, he, he's showing up for us in very different ways. God will never abandon us. He will never forsake you. He will never leave you alone. There is one who was left alone. There is one who was forsaken and his name is Jesus. Look at this. This is, this is so cool, guys. So God is with us. And he will never abandon us. Why? This is why. Mark 15, 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is one who was forsaken and it's Jesus. The first Corinthians 5, 21 tells us that in this moment, as Jesus is on the cross and he's dying in our place, it says, he who knew no sin, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. In this moment, Jesus takes our sin upon himself and the father pours out the cup of his holy, righteous wrath against sin. And Jesus drinks every last drop. And in this moment, the father turns away and Jesus was forsaken. Jesus was alone. For the first time ever, there was a break in their relationship. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was forsaken. Jesus was abandoned so that you and I never would have to be. He took our sin upon himself, dealt with it once for all. And now we will never be forsaken by our God in Christ. He finished that work. And now we have a far more beautiful truth than the reality that God is with us. Listen to this. God lives in us. What? Like that should never become just a trite truth to us. God lives in us. This was not true for the Israelites in the pages of Exodus. They're going to build the tabernacle later on in their story. And eventually they'll build the temple. And these were dwelling places of God among his people. But their sin had not been dealt with yet. And God doesn't live in sinful places. And so he they didn't have the spirit living in them like we do today. But look at these beautiful truths from the New Testament. God lives in us. Um, in Colossians 1, 
Paul's talking about a mystery that's been hidden for ages, that the Gentiles are going to be included in the gospel. And another part of that mystery is God is going to live in his people, not in temples built by man. Look at this. To them, God chose to make known, that's the Gentiles, how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ has made you and I by the finished work of him on the cross. Uh, He's made us his dwelling place. It's not just that God is with us. God lives in us. This is a far more beautiful truth. The most beautiful thing we get in the gospel is God himself dwelling within us, empowering us to transform and overcome, to have power over sin, to live daily in the presence of the Lord, every moment aware of his presence in our lives, to be guided by him, to live on mission by his power of the spirit. Christ in you, the hope of glory. They had all kinds of symbols of God's presence, right? The plagues, the parted sea, the quail, the manna, the, the, the waters that were provided, but they didn't have God in them. First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? That's God in you, in me whom you have from God. or You are not your own. You were bought with a price. And that price was the precious blood of Jesus. And because of his finished work, God now dwells within you and I. This is a beautiful truth so that no matter what dark hallway you're walking down, no matter what deep valley you're walking through, no matter what bitter circumstances come your way, you have God within you and he's transforming you and he's empowering you to live according to his glory and your good despite circumstances. So in the midst of bitter, difficult circumstances, can you trust the God who's not just with you, but who is in fact living in you. And I want to just close with just a practical piece of advice. You probably will never trust somebody you don't know, right? And the endeavor of a disciple of Christ is learning who their Lord is for the whole life. We never get it all figured out. And so I would ask you, how are you becoming, how are you learning who God is? And I don't just mean Bible knowledge and information. It's easy to read scripture for information. I'm talking about reading scripture for relationship. How are you getting to know the God of the universe? The God who lives in you. And there's practical tools like daily prayer, not just giving God, God a list of your burdens and, or your needs or your complaints, but just talking to him, being in relational communication with him. And there's, a, there's a, a, a Bible reading method that's really reinvigorated my family's devotional time. It's called Lectio Divina. It literally translates to divine reading. And the idea is very simple. You take a small passage of scripture, you read through it, asking the question, what stands out to me? Because God often will prompt you as you're reading your word by, man, that word just really stands out. Or that phrase, I've never noticed that before. How, what does this mean? How do I... And then the secondary question is, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And you read through the passage, asking those questions, and then you read through it again, and then you read through it again, three or four or five times, and, and all the while praying, God, what are you saying? What, what does this mean for me? And for me and my family, as we've done this as our nighttime devotional, it has been a method that we are, are learning more in a relational way about who our God is, that we might trust him more despite circumstance, because we're not going to trust somebody that we don't know. And so for you, I highly encourage you, find a method of reading scripture and prayer that builds relationship between you and God. And if you're interested in trying out Lectio Divina, there's an app called Lectio 365. That's L-E-C-T-I-O 365. Um, and the, and the, there's voices just kind of walk you through the Lectio Divina process, all right? So I highly encourage you, spend some time today. Don't push it off till tomorrow or later this week. Spend some time today getting to know the God who lives in you. Thank you so much for joining us. And I, I want to leave us with this. And now the God who loves you says, go and make disciples. 
Love you guys. Thank you guys so much for hanging out, sticking around. I just want to leave us with just a, car, a couple of uh, parting challenges. As we've been challenged, as God has brought his people through crisis and sustained them in the midst of it, for us to evaluate, are we trusting God in the midst of Christ? The first question I just want you to evaluate is, have your circumstances begun to eclipse God? Maybe you're walking through a season or have been in a season of late where, where it's just really painful, difficult. Have they begun to eclipse God? Have you maybe made your, 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 your circumstances very big and kind of belittled who God is? And, and I would just encourage you, share that with a spouse or your parent or uh, talk about it in your family. Talk about it with a trusted friend. Um, talk about it with a peer, a coworker, somebody that you trust. And, 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 and be honest. This is a hard question to evaluate. But it can lead to really fruitful moment of repentance. So have they begun to eclipse God? The second question is just a personal challenge I'd love to give you. Write down the ways you've experienced God's presence in your life. I've been challenged to do this over the last Oh, six months or so. I've been writing a timeline of my story and it's been amazing to walk through it and think through it prayerfully and, 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 and parse out all the moments that God was actually present where I didn't see him before. And I'd encourage you, once you've wrote that down, um, come back to it a couple times this week. Pray over it. God, if there's anything I missed, help me to see where you were active in my life. Help me to see your presence throughout the pages of my story, like we see it in the pages of the story of Exodus. And then I would encourage you to, to share that, those moments with somebody else, that you can celebrate God's goodness and faithfulness in your life. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness, that you are a God who's with us and you are a God who made a way by the sacrifice of your son um, to live in us. And I just pray, God, um, for everybody on the other side of the screen right now, God, that they would begin to see and experience your presence among them, in them, in their life. I pray as they evaluate their timeline and their history, God, that you would just reveal moments where you were there shepherding, loving, caring, in control, the sovereign God of the universe. I pray you'd show them where you've been in their story. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Thank you again so much for joining us. I love you. Have a good day.